Thank you for that introduction. Uh, I generally don't like using a microphone because I like to talk with people instead of at people, but for the recording, I have to stand here and use the microphone. Usually, I start by saying, I'm going to try to explain things very clearly, but sometimes I slip into techno jargon or use insider language. If I start doing that, if I start saying things that don't make a lot of sense, just, just wave at me and I'll try to uh, be a little bit more clear. Today, what I'm here to talk about is bystander signaling. And that might not mean much to most people, but bystander signaling means how do you know that somebody's doing something? If I pull out my phone and start doing this, most people in the audience are gonna know that I'm recording you. That's bystander signaling. You don't know that because a law was passed that said that. You know that because that's how people use technology and that's what you expect when you see it happen. With new technology like this, there's new things that are happening. And to new consumers, new users, new people who don't already know what this is, it can be confusing. And so we need to explain to people in a, in a clear way what devices are doing so that people understand, oh, that person's just recording or that person's doing something. And it doesn't feel weird to the person who's doing it. They don't feel like everybody's staring at them. And the people around feel comfortable of, oh, if that person's recording, I might not want that. I'm going to step away or I might ask them not to. Those things are developed by the way that people use technology. They're not developed by laws, and they're generally not developed by policy people like me, but we have a responsibility to help society develop those systems and norms so that all of our products and all of our services in the XR industry can uh, be successful. So what I'm gonna talk to you today is a little bit about how cameras have evolved over the last 100 years and how we've considered that evolution into building a framework for bystander signaling. And the reason why we're presenting it here is a contribution to the XR community over what we think the right answer for this is. We know this will continually evolve and this may not be the final answer. Things might change over time, but we invite the community to have that conversation with us. But first, who am I? Why, why should you listen to me? Uh, thank you for that lovely introduction. Uh, I've been working for Meta, Facebook, for about five years. I started when we were operating under the code name Building 8, and I came to the company to help design our systems for how we build. I've been here for five years. I've worked on most of the AR and VR products that you've seen from Meta and Facebook, worked on all of them in some capacity, and I've also helped develop the systems for how we build products. And how we build products is just as important as what we are building. As mentioned, I come from international human rights, uh, community, uh, tech policy community. Before that, I used to work for the American Congress and focused on issues like uh, surveillance reform, digital surveillance, and encryption. So I bring a lot of experience to the company, not just in technology space, but in the expectations of communities around technology, particularly for human rights defenders, communities at risk, and international communities. But today, I'm here to talk about building the metaverse. The metaverse is not here yet. An interoperable network that replaces cell phones is obviously still years away. However, we're starting to see the technologies and services that are going to evolve into that metaverse. We at Meta know that Meta's not gonna do it alone, and we don't think the industry can do it alone either. We're designing and building products for human beings, and human beings need to be at the center of that design loop for things that help human beings. I said human beings, not users, because users are only the people who buy the products. They are not the only people who are impacted by the products. We understand that bystanders and the general community at large has a role to play in this as well. Most people overlook this, because at Augmented World Expo, we like to show off our new technology. We like people to say, oh, what is that neat new thing that somebody's got? In Santa Clara, you see people with holograms, and they're out, and they want you to approach them and see what that neat thing they're doing is. In the real world, consumers and people are not like that. They don't like it when a room full of people is staring at them. You've probably seen the greedy tube girl that is so famous because she was brave enough to do this thing with everyone looking at her, wondering what she's doing. Most people don't want to be stared at and like, what is that person doing? That's weird. We like to be uh, able to capture in the moment and do what we want, but we don't want to be the center of attention or have to describe or, or be the ambassador for the new technology itself. 
I talk about this as feeling socially safe. You have to feel socially safe to use new technology. And so in this presentation, I'm gonna to talk to you about the framework that we use to develop the bystander signaling for our current smart glasses, our next generation smart glasses we just announced, and the framework that we will apply for our future XR devices and AR devices going forward. Again, as I said, I'm sharing with this space because we think that this is not just something that Meta can do. We think this is something the industry should think about collectively. It won't make sense if we are doing one thing and everybody else is doing another thing and somebody else is doing another thing. It won't make sense to anybody what is happening. And if there is confusion about what XR technology is doing, there will be confusion among bystanders, which will make users feel uncomfortable, which means our entire industry is threatened. So I'm really excited to be able to share this with you. Also, I'm really excited that I got a bunch of lawyers to say that it's okay for me to share this with you. I've been working on this light for years and it's really nice to actually be able to talk to people about it. Okay, so we launched our first generation of smart glasses in 2021 with Exlor Luxottica, famous for their Ray-Ban styles. Ray-Ban is a great brand, it's awesome, it looks great. And we approached it with what we called a form factor first design. We took the form factor and comfort that people are familiar with and packed as much technology into it as we can. This is not an AR device, but it's an inevitable step on the way to AR devices. From that first generation, we talked to a lot of people about what they liked, what they didn't like, and what we needed to improve. We describe this process as a responsible innovation process to make sure that we're building iteratively with feedback from experts, from the, from the users, from the bystanders, and from the community at large. And with these new smart glasses, frankly, they're just awesome. Uh, they are lighter, they are thinner, they have better cameras, they have better audio. I am really impressed with the audio. I wish I could demonstrate it for you all. They are really cool. Find me afterward if you wanna check them out. I don't think we have them at our demo booth, but I really love these things. We also have new AI features coming that we'll be able to use with them. And in, in building out this, we've embedded privacy throughout, and we've talked to privacy experts and policy experts about how to make sure that we're doing this responsibly and introducing them in a new way. One of the things that we heard with our first generation is that we had a light on it that sent signaled when it was recording, but there was some confusion about what the light was. It was too small, it was hard to see. And so with this new version, the light is just bigger and brighter and it has a pulsing mechanism for when you are recording. I'm gonna try this and I'm not, I don't know if it's gonna work with the spotlight on me, but I'm now recording right now. I don't know if you can see the light from here but we've designed it in a way that we've tried to consider different ways where it might show up so that it would be visible under all sorts of different circumstances. We also heard that, well, that's silly. If I'm a bad actor and I wanna record people in weird ways, I'll just put a little piece of tape over it and then that won't work. So we developed tamper-resistant technology. We put a light pipe in this. So if you put tape over this or disable this light in some way, the cameras and microphones will also disable so it can't work. There are bad actors in the world. There are people who wanna do bad things. We've designed this so that if you wanna do bad things, don't come here, go, go find something else. And everything that we've put into this, we wrote into a paper. We wrote into a paper for a couple of reasons. First, it's good for user transparency. We should tell people what we're doing and why, but also as a contribution to the community because as I said, we think that the industry collectively has responsibility here. So I wanna start by talking about the evolution of cameras. First, I don't think anyone in this audience is gonna be surprised to learn that computers need to see the world in an egocentric perspective in order to enable augmented reality. That's a very complicated sentence to say to most audiences. I think people at Augmented World Expo get that. But for AR to work, your system needs to understand the world the way that you do. And we often focus on the technological challenges of what that means, of the, the slam cameras or the, the various hand tracking or eye tracking or all the scene reconstruct, all the technology that goes into that. But we shouldn't overlook that to most people, we're just putting cameras on things and then a bunch of techno babble happens. They care about the AR experience, but they understand it's a camera or a sensitive. And we can't overlook what a momentous moment that is in the history of development because the history of privacy is actually mirrored the history of the development of cameras. I'm gonna explain why. The development of cameras and the development of privacy laws have actually mirrored each other for a long time. The first 
Kodak Brownie camera, the first mobile camera, came out in the 1900s. And immediately society was shocked of, what are we going to do about this? How can people take pictures anywhere? In fact, in 1888, Kodak invented the first portable camera. And then just two years later, in 1890, Louis Brandeis and Samuel Warren wrote a profound essay called The Right to Privacy that defined what we, at least in the United States, think of as our fundamental right to privacy. And Brandeis later became a Supreme Court justice and argued for a constitutional right to privacy, which is how we interpret that today. That Fourth Amendment right to privacy is the foundation of many rights that we consider normal in America and foundation for mo most of what we think of as our right to privacy in society. That was controversial. In 1901, the New York Times wrote an article about a new president, Theodore Roosevelt, and he called a Kodak fiend because a teenage boy set up a camera and took a picture of the president as he was leaving a church across the street from the White House. I'm going to read the article. As soon as Mr. Roosevelt reached the sidewalk, he saw the boy with a big box immediately and raising his hand in a signal to a pol bicycle policeman standing nearby and said, stop that, stop that. The officer jumped in front of the camera and the president strode forward almost at a run. Coming up to the boy, he shook his finger menacingly at him, declared him, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Taking a man's picture as he leaves a house of worship, it's a disgrace. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Later, President Roosevelt tried to ban photography in public places and parks. And I think at least American presidents and most of us have changed our perspective on what cameras can do and whether or not they should be used in public today. But that wasn't the end. In 2000, the first mobile phone, the Kyocera VP210, was sold in Japan. In less than a year, in 2001, there was widespread fears. Oh my gosh, there's mobile cameras in this device that you can move around. People are going to use it to take upskirt shots when you're going up the subway. People were terrified that this was going to happen. And so carriers, knowing they want people to buy these things, they developed these bystander signaling mechanisms so that you would understand what they were doing. They had the giant light and the ch -ch -ch sound. And I want to note, those, dis those bystander signaling, they didn't come from laws. There are a few jurisdictions that still require that, those things, but they didn't come from laws. They came from how do we make it so people can understand what these devices are doing and then people can work it out. So there are some venues today, like movie theaters, or I, I went to the opera last night, it was lovely, uh, where you're not allowed to use it. And they put up signs and they enforce that by saying, you can't do that here and you should leave. There are other places where it's just social norms that accept what's available. Like a public beach, if I were walking around holding a camera, filming people, people would object. There's not a law, you don't call the bicycle policeman. You, people object and they feel comfortable because they understand what the technology is. And expectations around cameras continue. Some of you might be aware around the controversy around body cameras on police officers. Police recording and recording of police has had profound impacts on society, at least where I come from in the United States. Recording police and their interactions with communities at risk has been fundamental to understanding social issues like over-policing and systemic discrimination. It has been a driving force in the social justice movement for the last 10 years. I should acknowledge all of my references are from the United States. That's my lived experience. But recording in public is different in different jurisdictions. And even international organizations that focus on documentation like Witness uh, struggle with educating people about what the rules are and what the norms are in different jurisdictions. And I have this quote up here that even the ACLU acknowledges, this is an evolving space. What we expect changes over time, like with cell phones. They don't have that ch -ch sound anymore because it became annoying. We know what it means when somebody's holding up their camera. So how do we take the evolution of cameras and apply that to this novel form factor? One thing we learned is that social cues are the most important thing, and social cues often take them, take, uh, derive from technical cues. For example, um, these new devices have cameras in different places. You may not expect that. But we've learned from the 2000s that this has changed. This is normal. People have seen cameras in new places, and they've come to adapt. We've, they've come to adapt because they take things that they expect from devices, and they apply them in the new context. For example, the known cue of that light, that was not originally meant as a bystander signaling. Original cameras needed a lot of light to get light into the system so that you could protect, pro, uh, pro, 
create photography. You need light in the system, so you need a giant light that goes off. But that giant light that goes off was a signal to people that something was happening. And so that technical cue became a social cue, and that social cue became how people knew that something was happening. Now the social cue is usually a physical moment of me holding something up. So we started with these technical cues and tried to figure out social cues, but we didn't do it alone because no matter how smart I think I am, the community is never going to say, oh, well, Nathan said it was okay, so, you know, it's, it's fine. We understand that this is a collective discussion. So we've gone all over the world talking to experts uh, from different regions, different lived experience, different social and policy expertise to understand how do we translate what people expect into this novel form factor so that they can understand what's coming in the future. We have international engagements, we have advisory councils, we have regular syncs with policy experts, so we don't just show up and say, hey, does this make sense? We build collaboratively with people and say, this is what we're thinking. Does it make sense? What do you think from your perspective? And we evolve that over time. And based on those engagements, we've developed a framework which defines, defines the criteria and considerations we think make sense for wearable bystander signaling. And in the absence of regulation, which I don't think is necessary, we need to have a conversation. We need to have community develop this. Eventually, I think AR is going to be so prominent, everybody in the, the world will have them as much as everybody has cell phones, and you'll just expect them in society. But how do we get from here, where we are now, where they are novel technology, to where they are expected? That will take iteration, and that will take communication, and that will take design as we evolve, and we want to do that not just as meta, but together as the industry. So some of the things that we've learned. As with cameras since the 1900s, our primary signaling method is that LED, that light. That is what people are familiar with. They know, hey, something's going on with those. They may look like regular Ray-Bans, but they've got a light on them. Something is happening here. That gives you the indication of there is something happening, and that is the prerequisite for understanding what is happening, and potentially if you don't want to be recorded or you don't want to be involved doing something about that. Some of the things that we've learned. The LED, to be helpful, it needs to be consistent. That may seem obvious, but you need to know every single time, if I'm holding my camera, my phone up like this, it means something. You need to understand it needs to be reliable. Second, it needs to be perceivable. If that light is too small, or if that light is not noticeable or doesn't show up, doesn't mean anything to anybody because you're not going to see it. It also needs to be communicative. And this is where the industry standardization and why I'm talking to you comes into play. People need to understand what that light means. If you have a bunch of different lights doing a bunch of different things from a bunch of different manufacturers, it's really confusing and you're not gonna understand what they mean. It needs to be consistent and communicative of this is what it means, this is what it always means. We also learned some things about what it should not be. The first is it can't be, or it needs to be unobtrusive. It can't be overly annoying to bystanders or to the user themselves. If I had a giant flashing light, I had a GIF from The Simpsons where it's like, this is my okay alarm. As long as this alarm is going off, everything is okay. But apparently I'm not allowed to use uh, Simpsons GIFs in public presentations. But you get the idea that if it's really annoying and going off all the time, one, it's gonna be annoying to everyone around you and it's gonna be annoying to me. I'm not gonna wanna use it. I'm just gonna you know, take out my phone and take a picture that way. We also learned we can't over signal. People don't want to learn Moore's code of lights. They don't want to learn a bunch of different signals. They want to be able to, okay, the light is on, I know what is happening. I don't want to know what two long beeps and a short beep mean. I don't want to know what a red and green flag actually means. It needs to be simple. It can't overload the user or the wearer. If you signal too many things and in too many different ways, it's counterproductive that it just doesn't mean that much to the, to the people around you. So, at the end of the day, we're building great consumer products, and we want to bring, build services that delight people and bring the world together. Our research engagements and signaling framework have been reflected in the way that we have designed the newest iteration of our Capture LED. And as we continue to iterate on this, we're going to combine past principles to novel improvements in the technology, we're going to talk to people, we're going to talk to experts, we're going to talk to folks like you, and we're going to continue to iterate this in hopes of developing systems that are clear and understandable to people that make XR approachable and understandable to the community writ large. This is the solution that exists today. We know that this is going to evolve and change over time as the community develops more different types of technologies and people become more familiar with them in the world. 
But I'm here because we think this is a conversation that the industry should have. For people to understand and accept XR, they need to understand XR. And we need to bring that to them. We need to include people and we need to include them in our design process and think about not just the user and not just the use case, but also the user's entire being, entire world, and entire lived experience and where and when they are using these products. As a human rights activist, I think that's good for people and that's good for privacy. But it's also good for our industry and it's why we're inviting everyone here at XR, uh, I'm sorry, at XRA, XRA is the XR Association. This is Augmented World Expo. At Augmented World Expo to join us in this conversation. And with that, I really appreciate you all being here and listening to this talk. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to take some. This QR code is a link to the white paper, which goes into more detail about a lot of the, the technology and um, process you, we use to develop this framework. And um, if somebody could post that to my LinkedIn post about this session, I couldn't get it quick enough before, and, we, and people are going to want to know. So uh, that was fantastic. I learned a lot. And I'm sure there has to be a few questions. We've got about three and a half minutes right up here, and I'm going to bring you the microphone so that we can get your question on the recording. Uh, thank you for the talk. It's, it's good to know that this is thought in depth. Uh, behind the scenes when developing such a product. Uh, one quick question. Uh, how much of a discussion was there in terms of the color of this LED? Because when we look over there, historically on the cameras, it's a red, it's not white. Uh, wouldn't that be a bit better, more understood social cue? Yeah, uh, that is an excellent question. I'm going to go back to this side. Some of the things that we, we factored into this were the visibility, interpretability, and social comfort. We also have considered things like visibility. When you start to get into colored lights, one, there's some issues of people not feeling comfortable with it, with red and green flashing. You think of Christmas tree lights. Uh, you also have to think about designing for everybody and that there are certain colors that uh, people have trouble recognizing. So in balance, we found the thing that got people's most attention is that white light, that it's like the flash on your camera, that that is what makes sense to people and makes sense in the most context while also being unobtrusive to people around you. Okay, great. We have another question over here. Bert? I appreciate you putting the thought into this kind of thing. So you, you've shown us some of the signaling that comes from the hardware itself. Have you seen, uh, how does the social etiquette evolve from the users? Because this is a new use case. Are you seeing people use them in different ways from smartphones? Will you see them continuing to innovate in how we capture images and how we feel comfortable with that? Yeah, that's a great question. And actually, it makes me think I should update this presentation. Uh, when we released this product, we also released a website and give people links and in our onboarding flow direct to our responsible use landing pages where we explain what we consider to be appropriate use of use in public places with consent, don't use in, in bathrooms, things like that, that we try to contribute, here's what we think the responsible way to use this is, but we also are encouraging community to think about it as well and set their own standards. That there are places like the opera or theaters where they're gonna set their own set expectations that they don't want recording regardless of what it is. Other organizations are gonna be a little bit more okay with photography, but a little bit less focused on maybe the, this novel form factor, we're not okay with that. Um, I spoke with some folks who were talking about um, LGBT-friendly nightclubs, where photography is normal when you're going out, but some people are very concerned about being oh, seen in those environments. And so they might have specific rules of different kinds of photography and different kinds of camera that they're available. My former organization, Access Now, when we did conferences, we would put colored lanyards for whether or not we could take your photo uh, because human rights defenders might be there and taking their photo and saying they were there could be a problem. So we wouldn't use photography if somebody was wearing like a red, red lanyard. So we are trying to contribute to the development of those social norms. We are not trying to dictate what those social norms should be. All right, give Nathan a big round of applause. That was a great conversation. Thank you very much.